Des Moines, and all of Central Iowa, welcome to Max World Live. Max World is your world. Every day we talk about the issues and topics that matter most to you. And as always, it's your voice we want to hear in Max World. So join the conversation by calling 515-244-0077. And now, here's the host of Max World Live, J. Michael McCoy. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I am Tamara Scott, not J. Michael McCoy. J. Michael McCoy is, shall we say, uh, taking some time out, and we hope he'll be back tomorrow refreshed and ready to go. But you know how it is. before It hits you before you know it. You get up feeling fine, and then all of a sudden you realize you didn't feel so great after all. So Mac is taking it easy today, but in studio with me is Frank, as we refer to you, Frank. Did you say Frank the Verse? The Verse. Frank the Verse is in studio. Sir Ryan is the producer behind the glass that always makes us look and sound good, and we appreciate his skill back there. In studio is someone that I have interviewed over the years, I have admired over the years, I have listened to and been educated by over the years, he's been so kind to, um, when I've called and asked him to be a guest, he will he will be so kind to come off the podium and, and take that phone call from the podium or be talking to me on the way to the podium. It's just such a servant's heart. Today, today I actually physically snatched him <laughs> from the podium. <laughs> he is here with the Pastors and Pews Conference, the American Renewal Project that is happening. And if you don't know about that, I encourage you to get online, the American Renewal Project, a uh, group that David Lane has put together going through and encouraging pastors, blessing pastors and their spouses, but training pastors and spouses, not just of the things we can do, but the things we must do to keep this great country, one nation under God. And so uh, today I'm, I'm honored. I've interviewed Congressman Bob McEwen several times, many times on phone, but I've never got to have him in the studio with me. So thank you, Congressman McEwen. Well, thank, thank you for you. joining me. The pleasure is mine. Thank you very much. And even survived my quick drive over here. Uh, fortunate. Yeah. <laughs> fortunate. Congressman, do you find it difficult to turn Tamara down? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> she is a blessing to the nation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so Congressman McEwen, out of Ohio, served in the state legislature how many years? Uh, three terms. Mm -hmm. In the U.S. Congress? Six terms. And so what I love about you is you have this ability to incredibly um, explain to folks with great ease the difficult situations and issues of our day. You just make it so simple. Well, part of that is the fact that politicians like to make things complicated, and they're really not. But if they can convince you that you don't understand what they're doing— uh, then you're reluctant to, to become involved or to hold them accountable. And so what they, they throw little words around, little phrases, and to intimidate people into thinking that they don't know what they're up to. And uh, I'd be glad to talk about a couple of those because, very simply, there's two words that every American should understand. One is authorization. That is where you get the authority to do something. And so a committee such as Armed Services would give the authority for 230,000 uh, Marines or 400,000 uh, Army uh, soldiers but the uh, the authorization to do that has to be signed by the president, passed both houses. But it really doesn't mean anything because you take that authorization and then you go to the appropriations committee and they appropriate the money according to the way they want to do it. So if you understand those two things, what is an authorization and what is an appropriation, then the, you will not be snafu'd by politicians when they come along and say, well, we don't have the money for this or is, you understand this committee or that. It, it, it's, as I say, not complicated once you see it and understand it. And so the budget has to do with the appropriation, and uh, the Congress is supposed to pass 11 of those appropriations, but what they do and what they did this year is they refuse to pass any of them. Because if you did, every time they came up to the floor, then you could say, why are you spending this on agriculture, and why are you spending that on interior? But if you wait till the end of the year, don't do your work, take six weeks off in August and September, uh, the fiscal year begins every, October 1st. So all of this has to be done by October 1st every year. It's not like it's a surprise. <laughs> so it has to be done October next year and the year before, after that and the year after that. So everybody knows it. So you know in January and February this is coming. So if you just do your work through the year, then come October 1, you're able to do it. But leadership, 
that is the president and the speaker and the majority leader, they get together and say, if we do it during the week, during the year, then people could keep track of us. Why don't we wait? Why don't we just take vacations and piddle around and wait until the end of the year? Whereas if we don't pass it now, all in one fell swoop, one big 1300 page volume, then uh, we will force people to have to vote for it or the entire country will come crashing to a halt. And so that's what they've done, and that's what they do. That is exactly what they've done. And so what we need to do is, is support people like Steve King and others say, nonsense, enough of this. Do your work when you're supposed to. And that's what Paul Ryan has promised that he's going to do. So we're going to find out next year uh, whether or not he will. And what he, that's called regular order. We're going to pass it. And if I were Speaker, I'll just tell you very simply, Tamara, what I would do if I were Speaker, and remember the Speaker creates the committees, appoints the members, and chooses the chairman. The speaker, once you vote for speaker, you've made every decision that's going to be made in the Congress. So that's that's the one that really matters. And once the speaker is in charge, then he is supposed to be able to move this thing. And what I would do if I were speaker is I would take I would say to the chairman of the Agriculture Subcommittee, you have the first week of March and your bill has to be ready and it's going to be on the floor. And if it's not, I'll get a chairman who will. And the next week I'll, you have the Interior and, and State Department. And the next is armed services. And I would go through them, and we would do our work. It All it needs is, it doesn't re- take a full backbone. Just two vertebrae would do it. Just a little bit of leadership. <laughs> just an ounce of leadership. Uh, and, and we could do it properly, and people could keep track of what they were doing. But now when it's in one big bill, every congressman can come back and say, well, I agree with you. We really shouldn't have to do that. And I only had one vote on everything. And it, it keeps them from being accountable. Frank, I've never seen you so jumpy. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, in most reputable church denominations, including the one I, I go to, uh, if you give in a tithe and offering envelope and you earmark a certain amount of money for a certain project, a certain mm-hmm. fund, mm-hmm. that church secretary can't deviate that money to something she wants to pay because it needs paid. Like, like let's say there's a parking lot fund or something, a roof fund. She can't take money from the roof and parking lot fund to pay the electric bill. Right. That's just the way our, our organization works. Should Congress work along those lines somehow, some way? Well, theoretically, it does. And once the money is appropriated, then the money has to go for that cause. And um, it, 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 it could be reprogrammed. That is, you can take it and use it for another purpose within that department, but it has to notify the Congress, and then Congress has to react and, and, and can disavow it. So if, if the Congress uh, appropriates money for some F-35 fighters and, and the Secretary of Defense decides that those aren't ready yet, I don't want to spend money on until they finish it up. And in the meantime, I'd like to use that money over here on a ship. Uh, he can then r- redirect that money, but he has to notify the Congress, and the Congress has the authority to prevent that from happening if they so choose. Mm-hmm. So that's why the Appropriations Committee is so important. Does that always get done? Well, uh, no. And that's, and that's where, uh, see, government, I think Paul Harvey said it best, self-government only works with self-discipline. <laughs> and if you have people that are lazy, and many politicians are, I would say most are. Yeah. That is, they don't want to make decisions, so they don't mind. See, they like the excuse of being able to have all this float around at the end of the year. Then they can come back and look you square in the eye and say, I agree with you. I don't think that should happen. Yeah. But uh, this was my only option. Well, we've got to back it up a bit. You voted for the guy that did this, and therefore you're accountable. And what I, you know, and I've done this my whole life. I worked for my predecessor before I ran for the legislature, and uh, and I, he asked me one time because I spoke at Rotary clubs, and all, he said, "Bob, what do you talk about?" I said, "I just tell them what you guys do." He said, "What what do you mean? It's got to be boring." I said, "I said, Congressman, they don't know. They literally don't know." And so I will explain that Congressman Tom Lucan from Cincinnati, who is a devout Catholic who faithfully speaks how pro-life he is and, and votes pro-life every time, he votes to set a speaker who is anti-life, who chooses chairman of committees who are anti-life, that makes sure that under no circumstances any pro-life legislation will ever move. Now, once he's done that, he can then run back to his own district and say, oh, I'm with you, I'm with you, it's terrible, those people up there, but he's already set the rules. Now, once, you, once that word got out, and, he, and people discovered what he was doing. They said, but you voted for her to do that. And so that's, that's what people need to know. The American government works when people are aware of what's happening. And when you tell the truth, you don't fear people finding out. When you're playing games, you want to hide in the shadows. Sure. That's right. 
So, Congressman McEwen, you make it sound so simple. For those of you who are just turning in, I'm talking with Bo- Congressman Bob McEwen. You can find information on him at bobmcewen.com. Bob and McEwen is MC, capital E W E N, bobmcewen.com. Check out some of the resources that he has. He has a great CD called Politics is Easy as Pie. It doesn't get any more simply explained than that. And there are other resources there, I'm sure, as well. And you can. Just learn. Do you do blogs? Do you give articles? How do you? Uh, to a degree. And I am the executive director of an organization called the Council for National Policy, CNP. And um, we, we on our website, constantly try to bring articles, conservative articles together. And that's uh, cnp.org. Cnp.org. Mm-hmm. All right. You mentioned something earlier today, and I want to come to it at the end of the hour, but let's just, we've got maybe just uh, a minute here. Um, do you think that we're not in that horrible of a spot as a nation. We, we People are so distraught. They're, they're, they're fearful. They're angry. They're, they're not apathetic as much as they just don't feel hopeless. like what they, yeah, they're hopeless. Yeah, they're, they've lost hope. And so uh, I'm, I'm speaking tomorrow, uh, Saturday morning to state legislators from all over the country. They gathered together, uh, brought there by David Barton on Saturday, uh, on this weekend after the, the election. And on Saturday morning, I'm speaking and he said, what we want you to do is just explain where America is. And I'm telling you this, America has been in a lot worse condition a lot of times, and uh, not the least of which would be George Washington at, at Valley Forge. No one supported him, and uh, a third of the people wanted him beat. A third of the people don't want America to destroy, but they did. A third of the people didn't care, and he had no money and no capacity. Now, that would be a hard time to do something nobody had ever done in the history of man. Right. And so leadership fixed it, but we'll talk more. Very good. You've just heard it. I said he was succinct. I told you he had just made it so um, easy for us. Stay tuned because you're going to hear more of this wisdom in the next hour. And then the second hour, a man by the name of Wallace Henley will be joining me with his book about Churchill. We'll be right back after these messages. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can give these grandkids back, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We can help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. 
From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. And I am Tamara Scott, sitting in for J. Michael McCoy. You are listening to Max World Live as you take your drive on the way home. I hope you had a good day. I hope that when you pick up the kids up home from school or wherever you're meeting your family, um, I hope that you take time out to be a family this evening. It's so hard as you're running from basketball practice or baseball or what is cross country still going on now? I don't know. They were running like a week ago, and I was surprised it went this late. My, yeah. I was not athletic, so that was might not be getting my a little thing. cool, but it could be at the tail end of it. So, whatever your plans entail this evening, I hope that they are taking time out with your family. Be thankful for the gifts that you have. Be thankful for those God put in your life, and uh, just take some time out to enjoy this Iowa weather because it will not be around much <laughs> longer. <laughs> so, I am in studio with Frank the Verse, sitting in for. Mac, as he recuperates, with Congressman Bob McEwen, McEwen from Ohio. And Bob is speaking at the Pastor and Pews Conference right here in Des Moines. He'll be speaking. Are you speaking Friday morning? I'm actually speaking tonight. Tonight. Mm-hmm. Oh, very good. For those of you who didn't get tickets, I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. You, so sorry. That's well, all I can say. We need to say something. On November 24th, ah. there will be another one. At, it's going to be held uh, here in Des Moines at the Holiday Inn. And um, Marco Rubio will be one of the speakers, and it's a luncheon. It starts at 11.30 and goes until 8.30 that night. And so an Iowa pastor's policy briefing on the 24th. So if you miss the one today and tomorrow, there's another opportunity so here in So they go to American Renewal Project, or where do they go for, is the 800 number on there? 800-921-1928. So all you have to remember that part is the 921. So 1-800-921-1928. 1928, and you can call and, and register pastors, and uh, any anybody who, in, any pastors that you know or pastors, you should bring a friend, because quite frankly, this nation is involved in a spiritual battle that has been abandoned. The, the spiritual leadership of the nation has basically left the field the last 30 to 40 years, and we're paying the consequences Amen. at the moment. Absolutely. So we have people tell us that's uh, political, This that's spiritual, this is political, or or the new movement, uh, we believe in science, not your faith-based um, um, mm-hmm. feelings. Well, the scriptures is scientific. And uh, I, I saw just a list, I, I wish I had it in front of me, in which the people, scientists said that the earth was flat, but show where the scriptures said repeatedly that it's the sphere that God hung in, in the air. And they had a whole series of, of things that the scientists said that scripture said the opposite, but the scripture was true. And eventually we began to see that indeed the God who made us and made heaven and earth actually understood how it worked. So uh, there are two, only, everything in life is one of only two, uh, one of two things, either it's spiritual or it's physical. And the wise person is the person who can figure out which is which. And uh, for example, love is spiritual. You can't buy a pound of it and you can't measure 16 inches of it. Joy is spiritual. Peace is spiritual. Uh, leadership, as we know, is spiritual. Uh, momentum in a football game is spiritual. You can't quantify it. There are physical things, buildings, block and tackle. That sort of you can you can see now. You cannot build a physical building with spiritual tools. You can have all the love and all the joy and all the peace, but you can't build a three-story parking garage with love and joy and peace. In the same manner, you cannot achieve love physically. You cannot achieve joy physically. One more boat. If I just get a new car, if I redo the kitchen, then I'll be happy. Mm. Or peace. You know, <laughs> five more tanks and two bombers, that'll give us peace. <laughs> no, it won't. Peace is spiritual. Now, a person who tries to achieve physical ends with spiritual tools is foolish. And a person who tries to achieve spiritual ends, try to achieve peace with physical tools, is also foolish. So when you said uh, uh, spiritual things, God is a spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There are people who say, I don't believe in that. Well, the scripture also describes that. A, a person who does not believe in God is said, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. So what does he try to do? He tries to achieve spiritual and the fool that doesn't know God, who lacks wisdom. He tries to think, if I just have enough physical relationship, I'll achieve love. No, you won't. If I just smoke this or I shoot this up or I take these pills, then I'll be at peace. No, you won't. Peace is spiritual. And so the scriptures explain to us how do you achieve those things. And the wise person, which would include our founders, understood 
that the scriptures were the source of love and joy and peace, the things that man searches for in life. And our nation was founded on those principles, and that's why it went from nothing to the richest, most powerful nation on earth and the lighthouse for the gospel. In our show on Tuesday, we talked about the Knoxville situation and the fact that city council members, nice people that they are, simply don't understand uh, the heat of this battle and the First Amendment and the Declaration of Independence, where our founding fathers mentioned the one true God four different times. They didn't make an ecumenical display and mention four different gods. They mentioned the one true God four different times. Uh, The Constitution was set in place to protect our freedom, the First Amendment, our freedom uh, to re- of, of religion, our freedom to worship as we see fit, our freedom of expression, our freedom of association. Congressman, you you brought this up, and I, I'm always amazed. At, I take notes every time you speak. Uh, I was amazed how much you knew about the situation in Knoxville. And um, Well, isn't it interesting that you cut out a, a piece of metal. It, it is a silhouette. It's just a piece of metal. That's no threat to anybody. Barely four and they by carved five feet. it in the shape of a man kneeling with his uh, holding his, his, his rifle. And because he's kneeling with his head bowed, for those who understand, this is a spiritual battle. So the very concept of a piece of metal, of a silhouette of a man bowing his head, would cause an organization that is opposed, to, who understands the spiritual battle. They send a letter from Washington and threatening the city council to take it down. Now, they have no right to do that. This is a free country. You're allowed to do that if you want. There's nothing wrong with a piece of metal. And so what did the city council in Knoxville do? They said, oh, if you, who couldn't find Knoxville, Iowa with a map, <laughs> if, you, if you send this threatening letter to us, oh, we'll gladly accommodate you. Right. But fortunately, 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 finally, because of what's happened in the last couple of years with our president and others, the Christian majority of the people in this country have begun to start to almost twitch a little bit to wake up. And if they do, this country could be turned around on a dime. And what happened on Monday when they voted in Knoxville to take it down, on Tuesday the people went to the polls and those people, there were only two of them up at the time, and they were both removed from office. Uh, that's the proper way that we should do. We shouldn't surrender voluntarily like we have for so many years. We need to stand up and take take control of our country rather than allow it be stolen from us right from our hands. You know history better than I. Has appeasement ever paid off? Never does. It, 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 it encourages and invites the aggressor. Uh, weakness invites aggression. Anybody, <laughs> any second grader understands that. Uh, and, and, of course, weak, weakness... The United States has, we did it in the 1970s, and uh, more nations went Marxist in the Carter administration than any president since Truman. And uh, it looked as though America was finished. The Afri- there was an organization called the African Union. It was formed in 1980, and there was a conference on African unity at, at, at its first event. And they chose the person that they were looking to for leadership. That's the head of the Soviet Union. They brought President Leonid Brezhnev in to speak because America was in decline. We were learning to live with less, ride our, sweater, ride our bicycles, wear our sweaters, turn our thermostat down, wait in line for gas. America's coming to an end next Tuesday a week, and there's anything anybody can do about it. Jimmy Carter said we, we should just get used to it. And so when Leonid Brezhnev spoke to them in 1980, he said, because of what we are doing, that's the Soviet Union, by the end of this decade, that's 1989, we will be able to work our will any place on the planet because the correlation of forces, economic, political and military are on the side of socialism and communism. So because America was weak, nations went Marxist, the Soviets were aggressive, and and then the world went where the power was going to be. They made sure they were on the right side of the line. Well, uh, on election eve, November 1980, uh, a fellow that uh, had been governor of California, he said, there's nothing wrong with America. The proper leadership can't cure. He had a magazine, Time Magazine had a picture of John Wayne on it, and John Wayne had passed away, and it said, America's last hero. And he said, John Wayne was a friend of mine. I knew John Wayne very, very well, and no one would be more offended at that title, the last hero, than John Wayne. He said, this America's not finished. He said, all we need is, is good leadership. So uh, the gas lines for young people that don't know. See, socialism can destroy anything. And uh, so once... Carter took over the, uh, the oil companies. Well, of course, we had shortages, as they always would. Reagan came into office, took all those regulations, threw them in the Potomac, killed the fish, freed the country. 
And within a matter of weeks, there's no longer any gas lines. Cut taxes. People went back to work. Three out of every four jobs that were created on this planet in the 1980s were created in one country, the United States of America, such that by the end of the decade, 1989, the entire world was chanting USA, USA, USA. Now, what was the difference? Did America suddenly get smart and bright? No, it got decent leadership. It went from incompetency to competency. Well, we're pretty much back to the same way we were. Back when Carter left office, only one plane in six was airworthy in the United States Air Force. The reason you couldn't keep people in the Air Force was because all they did all day long was cannibalize one, one plane with the parts that they didn't have on, on the other plane to fly that one for a while and then take it apart and put it elsewhere. And people didn't, thought it was a waste of time. Well, we're virtually back there now. At this moment, at this moment, the Army of the United States is smaller than it's been any time since December 7th, 1941. The Air Force is the smallest it was on the day it was created. And the United States Navy is smaller than it's been any time since Teddy Roosevelt, which was before World War I. So we've elected Jimmy Carter to now three terms, and uh, we are back in the same place politically. The world does, doesn't trust us. But there's nothing wrong with America that proper leadership can't cure, and Iowa has more to say about that than anybody in the world. Okay. Okay, Frank. Um, you're talking about the military there, and I know you mentioned it earlier, and I just want you to touch on the fact that why why America needs our military, because the, the liberal left likes to beat us up for the money we spend on our defense or our military as if it's bad, and they always want to throw more at education, even though education continues to decline, and we don't show any um, responsibility over the dollars. There's no correlation between cost or dollars put into education and the achievement or accomplishment and goals of education. But they, they do like to beat us up on our military as if we're, what, what, what do they call us, war hawks? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why? Why well, is that? Well, there can only be one wor world leader. And um, it's the Spanish and then the French and then the British for 450 years. And now it's in America. By the way, in my study of history, no nation has ever become the premier nation on earth. But what it didn't seek it. They knew what they had to do to get there. They sought to accomplish it. And they knew what they had to do to stay there. And if you don't understand that, Historically, you can look at China and watch exactly what they are doing. They are seeking world domination and leadership. They know what the investment they have to make. They're building the world's largest blue water navy. They know what they have to do to take control. And at that point, they will then decide. Currently, Japan has, it has no oil at all. So 100% of its oil has to be imported. For it to be imported, it has to go through the sea lanes of the Pacific. Someone has to keep those ships safe. Someone. It was the British for 450 years. And since World War II, it was thrust upon the United States, the only nation in history that didn't seek it. And because of the United States, we have been able to maintain stability in the world, such that if a ship is attacked on the high seas, as happened over 300 times last year, to whom can they appeal? To the, to the Danish Navy? Well, the Danish Navy consists of six minesweepers. So chances are that wouldn't be a safe place to look. They can appeal to the United States because they know that wherever the American flag is, they will be treated fairly. America stands for fairness, which is a synonym for righteousness in the world. And that is what we provide. We are coming out on our next break. I think you're probably understanding why I sit enthralled when I hear the teaching of Congressman Bob McEwen. You can find him at bobmcewen.com. You can also find him at the CNP, is it dot, dot org? Dot uh -huh. org. CNP.org. Stay tuned because we'll be right back with more of this interview, more information. And I know you have questions. I can see Frank. It's driving him crazy. He has questions here in the studio <laughs> as well. We'll be giving you more information. Don't miss a beat. Keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, and your ears tuned here. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up 
with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu and some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a lot. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're going to make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. And we're back. I am Tamara Scott sitting in for Mac as he gets better. Mac World Live. You're listening to Mac's World Live, and we appreciate you being with us during your drive time. In studio with me is Frank the Verse and Congressman Bob McEwen. You can find information on Bob at bobmcewen.com or cnp.org. We're talking about everything America. Um, y you know it. I know it. Things don't feel right. There is unrest. There is unsteadiness. Um, we, we, we should be doing better. It, it actually feels a little bit better economically, but I think people are afraid to spend or do that big move, buy that car, whatever, because we're just not certain what's going to happen. Uh, we have uh, the caucus coming up February 1st, and off, the, off the, to the process of the next president of the United States. We have one candidate on one side, uh, a, com a communist, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, Bernie Sanders. He went to Moscow for his honeymoon <laughs> and felt that, as we know, the terrible, miserable, uh, life-stealing conditions that were there uh, 60 years ago or 40 years ago. And uh, was all the purges after Stalin and all that sort of thing, and then the shortages and the chaos, and that was his definition of perfection. He that was the place he wanted to go to celebrate, and has done everything in his in his uh, political life to make America like that. Uh, unfortunately, Ronald Reagan came along and kicked over the beehive, and they have more freedom now than they've ever had when he was there. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about this leadership thing. We we've, we've we've banished two leaders in the Republican. Uh, majority here of recent eric cantor and john boehner mm -hmm. and we were kind of having a discussion off air and you mentioned something that i guess i it didn't shock me but i kind of floored me a little bit that, that uh, well you never look to you never look to legislative bodies for leadership by definition you never look to a committee for leadership committees can't lead but you say the people who head these committees generally don't stand for nothing that's why they end up getting the committee ship i i, I use an example that uh my my friend Dennis Hastert was speaker longer than any Republican in the history of the United States of America. He just left just a few years ago. Everyone knows him, but there's not a person you can find who can tell me anything that he ever said or he ever did. That's the quintessential political legislative leader. If you put him in that chair and you're a congressman, you could come in and yell at him for an hour 
and he wouldn't make a sound. Do you believe what Pat Buchanan says, that Congress has abdicated its duties and responsibilities to, to the, the executive, to the judicial, because they're more worried about the ballot box and fundraising than they are on taking a tough vote? Well, yes, yes. There's only two reasons people run for office. Only two. One is to be there. I just want to be sheriff. I just want to be mayor. I just want to be the governor. And the other is to do something. And everybody is a combination of those two. They're 80-20 or 50-50 or 30-70. Those that just want to be there can get along with anybody anytime because they stand for nothing. And they become the person that lasts the longest and rises to the top. A person who's there to do something, I'll use an example, Ted Cruz, people that ran for office saying, we do not want somebody in Washington setting my bill, I open the mail, and I find out that my medical bill is going to go up $270 a month this month. I cannot find this person. It tells me I now have dental, prenatal dental care, and, <laughs> and I'm 65 years old, and there's no one I can talk to. I do not like this program. And so there are a whole series of folks that ran for Congress last year with the promise that if you elect us, we will put a stop to that. Well, poor Ted Cruz didn't read the manual. Mm -hmm. He goes up there and says, we're supposed to do what we said we're going to do. Mm -hmm. sure. And Mitch McConnell and all these, no, 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 Ted, sit down. You're not playing well with others. You actually are keeping, trying to keep your word. While you do that, you upset the whole apple cart. And he said, enough of this. I, I, we need to have a president that does this. You guys are worse than Makes awful. the rest of them look bad. He absolutely does. Now, the people that actually stand and want to do something are always in the minority, and they're uncomfortable there. And, and they, I've said this. I believe that executive skills, leadership skills, and legislative skills are virtually mutually exclusive. If you're good at one, you're awful at the other. Mm. And, and Ronald Reagan... Ronald Reagan couldn't sit through his own cabinet meetings. He would make a decision, and after a while, they would meet, break down in, into turf wars, and he'd look around and say, do I need to be here for this? Because he was making decisions and moving on. Mm -hmm. Now, if he couldn't listen to the, his own cabinet members squibble over nothing, he could. there's no way that he could sit in a committee hearing for eight hours talking about absolutely nothing. See, the only form of accomplishment a legislator has is that he comes out with a day and a half growth of beard at two in the morning with the sleeves rolled up, explaining how they came up with this package. Now, everybody in the world knows the packaging will last six weeks, but this is the closest thing to accomplishing <laughs> that they've ever done. People who are leaders do not like that. Yeah. And so, therefore, they, they exclude themselves. Sure. All right. So, when we have this pool of candidates, and we have a great pool of candidates right now, what would you tell the voters out there to really pay attention to? Well, I, I like uh, what, what Rafael Cruz said earlier today. Uh, all of them are going to say good things during the campaign, but uh, let's look at what they've done and where do they stand. And um, I appreciate what, uh, what Ted Cruz said the other day about appointing judges and that uh, George Bush appointed the, uh, the fellow from New Hampshire. I, I forget his name now. But, uh, uh, oh, David Souter. David Souter. And he said, this is a good guy because uh, deep down inside, he's a conservative. And, and Ted, Ted made this observation. He said, if you're 55 years old and you've never said anything or written anything that says you're a conservative, chances are you're not. And so we, we want people that look at their record. And if the record is empty or opposite, then make that decision. So we want people who, who vote the way who they also speak. And, um, but there's lots of good folks, All right. talented folks. We have a caller. I'll put my earphones on here. Hey, Bill, thanks for calling in. What's your question? And your, uh, is your question for the congressman? Yeah, well, it's for kind of everybody, I guess. I, I just, I'm at a loss. Uh, most of my life, I was a, a drug addict, a felon. I did time in prison. I got saved. I got out. I got my citizenship back. I started looking at uh, the way things were going. So I, and I started voting. But the last time that, and, and the congressman just touched on this, that everybody said, hey, we're going to go take care of Obamacare. We're going to go take care of this. We're going to, and they've done absolutely nothing. <laughs> so why, why do I care anymore? Why do I go vote for somebody who says, hey, I'm going to go take care of everything, but then they don't. Now, if Ted Cruz gets the nomination, I will vote for Ted Cruz because he does step up and do things. But how do you get that to change 
in Congress. Well, yeah. I, un- I understand your question perfectly. Yeah. I, I love this, and I just want to phrase it. We have. A, can I call you an ex-con? <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, and, and you're worried about the lack of honesty with those who are elected for office. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <isn't> it? <laughs> All know. right, Congressman, I'll turn oh. it over to you. <laughs> well, the thing the thing is that uh, I, you're you're exactly right, but it, we can't become weary in well doing because people are beginning to figure it out, and you'll observe that the, the chief protagonist of all right. that, the leader of the House, right. couldn't even survive his term. And uh, that that has only happened a handful of times throughout all of history. So yeah. they said they were going to do something, they weren't doing it, and people uh, like Steve King and, and a handful of 50 or so others said, you know, enough. Here we are, we've piddled away one year, we're about to go into a campaign year, and you've done nothing, son. And with that, uh, he began to leave. Now let me tell you who's next on, on the bar stool. Is going to be Mitch McConnell. So you need to stay at it and, and keep at it because we're about to take this thing back because people are fed up. They're more knowledgeable than they have been in the past. They used to sit around and do nothing and nobody knew about it. But now you can see and watch them. And, and we are, it's, it's about to right itself. And, and whenever you hit the bottom, as we did under Carter and as we did under, under a series of presidents, we bounce back up. And, and we've, we're dragging on the bottom at the moment economically, militarily, politically. Politically, the world is not a country in the world that trusts us. So it, we need new leadership, and this is a time to be involved, and, and we have the record of certain people to look at. Bill, thank you for letting me use you as humor with the, the con. <laughs> that's fine. You're an ex-con, new convert. And, but, you have to remember, it's ex. <laughs> that's right. Remember that's that. right. And redeemed, redeemed is just yes, such a great no, place to man. be. And, Bill, let me say one more thing. That people, politicians only care about two things. They care about money and votes. And if you walk away from the voting booth, that's the worst thing you can do to your country. And there's a few in Congress that need the convict title. <laughs> And on that note, we have another break coming up. But stay tuned. We have just a few more minutes with Congressman Bob McEwen. You can check him out on cnp.org or bobmcewen.com. Stay tuned because you're going to be challenged. There is no easy way out here, and it's up to you along with us. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi. My name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studio. We're back. I am Samira Scott. Thank you for staying tuned with us. I'm going to hold up a book for those of you who are watching uh, on the uh, on the website, webcast1live.com. God and Churchill and the author, Wallace Henley, will be joining me just a few minutes in studio. God is so good. I just love the surf, Amen. the waves he has me on. I didn't know I was going to get to do this when we woke up today. <laughs> How exciting is that? So you'll get to join us in the next hour. And uh, Wallace Henley will join us in studio and we'll be talking about God and Churchill. And so before we go, we're going to finish up with Congressman Bob McEwen. And I just can't say enough. Well. How much appreciate I appreciate your leadership, 
your wisdom. I envy what your kids had. I wish every child in America had the parent that you and Liz must have been raising your kids, being able to explain situations to them. Well, I envy the people in Iowa because the National Party, when Bill called in, what about the leadership? The leadership in Washington, we have a national committee chairman. The Republican National Committee has three members from each state. They have the state chairman. They have one man and one woman. And the woman from Iowa is Tamara Scott. Mm -hmm. That is the person who, along with her friends in Washington, makes the decisions for our, our leadership there. And uh, that is the person the president looks to for direction. And I'm, I'm America is blessed and Ohio is fortunate that you're the state committee, national Thank committee you. woman from Iowa. Thank but you. Uh, we were briefly talking about uh, Miss Hillary. And uh, let me just quickly, uh, I was on the intelligence committee and these folks were CIA agents or were sent over there by our country. And they saw that a, a, an ambassador, and, and we all think we know why he was there. He met with the, the CIA was <clears throat> was trying to gather up the arms that were floating across North Africa after they had overthrown the, the president there, Gaddafi. And so as they were gathering those together, the ambassador was meeting with the representative from Turkey, and we believe that the purpose was to take those arms and provide them to the Turks, who were then going to give them to ISIS in in Syria. But nevertheless, as he was meeting there unarmed, he was then attacked. And these former CIA, these CIA agents who were former SEALs, they had no obligation, but they had a commitment to America and they ride to the sound of the guns and they came over to rescue them. And they were on the, on the roof protecting that uh, American installation and the, and the employees inside. They constantly said into their microphones, are those drones armed? Now, that means that they understood how this works. That is that they have a beam, they ha and they can point the beam towards, towards wherever the threat is coming from, and the armed drones can then take out their antagonist. So they knew they were being watched. They kept calling, are those drones armed, as they're out there fighting for their life. Well, it happened that for the first hour and a half, the President of the United States and the Secretary of State were watching them until they got bored. And that Secretary of State <clears throat> was Hillary Clinton? Secretary Clinton's. of State was Hillary Clinton. Barack Obama went upstairs to play cards with Lovey Smith, his friend, while they were packing to go the following morning on a fundraising trip to California. She, Hillary Clinton, got in her car, went back to, to the State Department, concocting this story about a video. Pardon me, I have to clear my throat. <clears throat> the fact is that for the next five and a half hours, a total of seven and a half, the staff stay there and watch these men defend themselves until finally they were blown apart. Now, it never dawned on them, I promise you. It never dawned on them that the people were watching them die. Their presumption was that they are sending help someplace, if we can just hold on, because I can see the drones. I can hear them. I know that they know that we're here. And they kept saying, if they're armed, we can take them out, but they wouldn't answer them. And they kept fighting and hoping that someday help would come. They could have sent a plane from Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. in seven and a half hours and been there. They, they could have done it if they wanted to. But she chose not to and left them there to die. That person, in my opinion, should never be in charge of anything. If they should even be free. My main question is, she was under oath in testimony before Congress to Trey Gowdy, Jim Jordan, etc. And she, it, 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 strange credulity... She said that Chris Stevens was a great friend, so was Sidney Blumenthal. She had hundreds of emails from Blumenthal, but she said that Chris Stevens did not have her cell phone, her email, or her fax. Do, it, it, does that strain credulity well, to you? Well, probably not. And if they find it, yeah. if somehow it's on the cloud, NSA, if they find that smoking gun that yeah. he was begging 600 yeah. times for, for extra security... And they find that direct communication between Chris Stevens and, and her. What will happen? Nothing. Because, as she said, when they found the, the, the uh, conversation that she had that day with the ambassador from uh, with the prime minister in Egypt and elsewhere, she explained to them what this was. This was, was an armed attack by insurgents. While she went out to lie to the American people, that we had, and so there you had the two of them presented. And you remember what, what Marco Rubio said during the debate. The press said this was the highlight of her campaign, that she, that she had the best week of her campaign when she exposed, as they presented, here's what you said at this, and, and 30 minutes later, you said the opposite to the American people. Then two hours later, you said this, which was the truth, to the, to the other people, and you lied to the American people. And she just smiled and laughed and didn't affect her one part. And For people who say there's no difference between the parties... There is an example. Anybody who puts her bumper sticker on their on their bumper can has a, has assumed that when she 
is willing to directly and intentionally lie to the American people, they do not care. An electorate that does that is very damaging to our future. And did you see the snide brush the lint off the yep, shoulder yep, move? Yep, yep, yep. But if she's so callous with our military, she will be that callous with each and every one of us. Of course, of course. She Same got the power. 3 a.m. call, and she blew the 3 a.m. Three in the afternoon. <laughs> three in the afternoon, and she didn't even take it. What's, what's, to, to, what's to tell us she'll do any better with the next 3 a.m. call? Yeah, she won't. Let me, let me just say this. That in, a, in another couple of minutes, you're going to interview uh, Wallace Henley in, about Churchill. Churchill took over in just such a time as this. Mm-hmm. Prior to that time, uh, the British were the leaders of the free world. The United States didn't have anything to say about it. In fact, at Pearl Harbor, we had the 17th largest army in the world, smaller than Romania. But, but Britain f- abandoned its leadership. It was going down the tube. And at that moment, Churchill took leadership when everybody else recognized it was over. Britain, in his very first speech, he said, the battle of France has ended. The battle of Britain is about to begin. On this battle rests the hopes of all Christian civilization. So he had no army because 30 years, for 20 years they've abandoned it. All of his allies had, had been defeated, and it's now it's just him in leadership. And he drug FDR in it, kicking and screaming the whole way, don't you think? <laughs> well, he was, the, he, was the, he was the world leader. And when, but when they failed to do that, once leadership leaves a country, it doesn't go back. And so after World War II, you know, April 1st, 1947, a telegram was sent from Clement Attlee, the prime minister who replaced Churchill, to Harry Truman, which said, unless the United States intervened in the Cyprus crisis, Cyprus would be lost. The king had neither the capacity nor the will to intervene. And with that, the torch was passed to a nation that didn't seek world leadership, didn't like it, doesn't like to pay for it, but has done an excellent job, the United States of America. Amen. And of course, I have you know, thousands more questions I'd love to ask Congressman Bob McEwen. Caucus is coming February 1st. People must if vote. If you care about your country, you need to take at least an hour. Find out where it is. Call the county auditor's office. Show up at 7 o'clock. She'll tell you where and when to be there. And if you will do that for your country, nobody on the planet has as much impact on the direction of this nation as the taxpayer citizen registered voter of Iowa. Absolutely. And, if, and don't just show up. Don't believe what you're hearing in the media. Dig in. There's no reason in Iowa you can't meet a candidate. Show up to the coffee. Show up to the town halls. Hear what they're saying. Ask the tough questions. Now is when you have their attention. There is no excuse. You cannot rest in the fact that somebody else is going to do it. It's yours to do. Yours alone. And um, we only have, I think, so much more time in this country to do it and to do it without bloodshed or weapon. So thanks for t- uh, staying Spitting this time with us, we'll be right back with Wallace Hinley and Drive Time, Max Drive, Max World on Drive Time. We'll be right back. Thank you, Samantha.